Welcome to the History Den YouTube channel. This is the 13th video in the Ancient Greek series. Now in the last video we dealt with the Battle of Plataea, which really ended the Persian advance in mainland Greece. In this video we will discuss the second part of the Greco-Persian Wars, which is essentially the Greek counterattack against Persia. And this occurs around the Aegean Sea as the Greeks attempted to completely remove the chance of another Persian attack. So, in the summer of 479 BC, the Greeks assembled a huge army and marched to confront Mardonius at the Battle of Plataea that we talked about in the last video, of course. Now, the Battle of Mycale occurred roughly at the same time as the action going on at Plataea, but the difference was the Battle of Mycale was primarily a Greek Navy operation. The land army was on the move to Plataea. Now, before Mycale was underway, the Allied Greek Navy remained anchored off of Delos and this occurred after the Battle of Salamis, while the remnants of the Persian fleet remained at Samos. And for a time, both sides seemed unwilling to risk a major battle. Now, the Athenian navy under Santhippus joined the Allied fleet off of Delos, increasing the size of the Greek fleet. Now, we should keep in mind that Samos and many of the Ionian coastal cities are still under the control of the Persians. So it was at this time, with the Persians in disarray, that a delegation from Samos approached the Greek Allied fleet and suggested that the Ionian cities would all revolt if the Allied fleet would successfully engage the Persian fleet and liberate Samos. They also pointed out that the morale of the Persian fleet was at its lowest. So the Allied Greeks decided to go for it and sailed for Samos. When the Persians heard that the Allied fleet was on the move, they set sail from Samos and retreated toward the Ionian mainland. According to Herodotus, this was because the Persians did not believe they could defeat the Allies in a naval battle, so they decided to turn it into a land fight. Xerxes had left a sizable army there to guard Ionia and so it could assist the Persian navy and sailors. The Persians, seeking to avoid a battle, beached their fleet below the slopes of Mount Mycale, and with the support of the Persian land army, they built a heavily fortified camp. Now, the Persians had around 300 vessels, and the Greeks had around 250 ships. But again, that would play little role, as this had been turned into a land fight. The Persians checked in with about 60,000 men, and the Greeks had around 40,000. And remember, most of the Greek land forces were fighting at Plataea. The allies seemed to have formed into two wings. On the right were the Athenians, and on the left were the Spartans with other contingents. The Athenians marched across the ground towards the Persian camp, while the Spartans attempted to outflank the Persians by passing through more broken ground. This meant that the Athenians would begin fighting before the Spartans were engaged because they were trying to outflank the enemy. Herodotus reported that the Persians fought valiantly, but that the Athenians were trying to win the day before the Spartans arrived to claim credit for a major victory. And although the Persians stood their ground for a while, once again the Greek coplite was superior to anything the Persians had, and eventually the Persians broke ranks and fled to the palisade. So the Athenians tried to enter the camp in the front, and this was bitterly contested by the Persians. Finally, the Spartans arrived, outflanking the camp, and they fell in the rear of the remaining Persian forces, thereby completely surrounding the entire Persian army. Now, we have to keep in mind that there were some Ionian contingents fighting for the Persians, and as it became clear that the Persians were going to lose this fight, they began to turn on the Persians as well, and this turned the battle into a complete rout for the Greeks. There were heavy casualties on both sides, but the Persians took the brunt of it. They suffered around 40,000 casualties. Of the few Persians that survived, they made their way inland towards Sardis, but combined with the loss at Plataea, the loss at Mycale was a huge blow to the Persian interests in the Aegean Sea. After the dual victories at Mycale and Plataea, the Spartans began to look for ways to get out of the war. So a conference was held at Samos to decide what to do. The Spartans proposed that they evacuate the cities of the Ionian Greeks and bring the entire population to the Greek mainland, since it would be difficult to defend Ionia against what they thought would be a massive Persian counterattack. They also believed that after the twin victories of Plataea and Mycale, the second Persian invasion of Greece was over, and the Spartans believed as a result of those victories, the threat of a future invasion against mainland Greece was over. The Athenians thought differently, and the Greek admiral Santhippus vehemently objected to this, since the Ionian cities were close cut 
cousins of the Athenians. The Athenians believed the war should continue and they should press on against the rest of the Persian cities around the Aegean. So there is this vote held as to whether to assist the rest of the Greek islands and colonies around the Aegean. And predictably, the Spartans vote against continuing the war. But Athens and her allies vote to keep it going. Now we have to remember that even after the recent losses at Mycale and Plataea, the Persian Empire is still a huge and massive entity, and in reality had only been minimally affected by the losses in Greece. And so the Greeks, especially the Ionian Greeks, had no way of knowing whether the Persians might attack again. Now we know now the Persians were done with Greece, but at that time the Greeks had no way of knowing that. So the vote goes the Athenians' way and the Greek League will continue to attack Persian interests around the Aegean. So the next Next stop was the city of Sestos, which was the strongest town in the region and was one of the last cities in Europe still held by the Persians. After a protracted siege, Sestos finally fell, marking the beginning of a new phase in the Greco-Persian Wars, the Greek counterattack. The allied Greeks would also go on to liberate Cyprus in 478 BC and Byzantium a short time later. And so really, everywhere on the Aegean, the Persians are pretty much in retreat. So after Byzantium, the Spartans once again are looking to get out of the war. And again, the Athenians want to pursue a policy of aggression. And what we're noticing at this point is that Athens is starting to stand out on their own. The show had been pretty much run by the Spartans. And we have to remember now that the Athenians have the strongest navy in the eastern Mediterranean and are on their way to forming an empire. And with this renewed confidence, the Athenians begin to start to build walls around the Acropolis and make their existing walls even stronger. Some of Athens' neighbors, like Corinth and Thebes, begin to feel threatened by this, and it is their feeling that the Athenians might be more aggressive if all of their cities are walled. And so they take their complaints to the Spartans, who also voice their concern to Athens. But Athens doesn't care what Sparta or anyone thinks about the walls. And so, in a sense, they somewhat declare their independence from Sparta. They are no longer tied to the Greek League, from which, of course, Sparta had always been the de facto leader. Sparta doesn't like it, but accepts it. Many Spartans wanted to stay in the Peloponnesus anyways and stay out of the Aegean. But some in Sparta wanted to expand outwards and participate with Athens in the counterattack against the Persian Empire. One problem that develops is General Pausanias. Of course, Pausanias is the hero at Plataea. After Plataea, Pausanias joined the allied Greek fleet and assists in taking Byzantium. However, during this campaign, Pausanias is very rude to the rest of the Greeks, and he treats them almost as inferiors to the Spartans. He also got caught up in the wealth and splendor of Byzantium. And this was not just anti-Greek, it was very anti-Spartan. He started to behave more like a Persian noble, and even worse, a Persian satrap. And so he became an embarrassment to Sparta, and was charged in Sparta with tyranny and then treason for his activities. He was acquitted, but he was permanently sidelined and then put to death by the Spartans. And as we've seen with other heroes in the Greco-Persian Wars, Themistocles comes closest to mind, they all end up in disgrace. Now, the replacement for Pausanias is sent from Sparta, but is rejected by the Greek League. They don't want a Spartan anymore after Pausanias' activities. At this point, Sparta really just wants to get out of this whole fiasco. From Sparta's point of view, the Greeks came running to them when the Greek mainland was threatened, and now they are rejecting our leadership. And so with this, Sparta is simply done and goes back to administrating the Peloponnesus. And so the Greek League turns to Athens and asks them to take the lead and the role of Sparta as the de facto leader. So the Athenians have the leadership and their huge navy now. This really is Athens' moment where they become the true power in Greece along with Sparta. This is no longer Sparta running everything as it had been during the Greek League. It's Sparta and Athens participating on a level playing field. So Athens and her allies decide to form the Delian League. And this is different from the Greek League. Now the Greek League had been a perpetual league, and it actually doesn't go away even when the Delian League is formed. There's still an idea that it still exists. Now in terms of the Greek League, the charter meant that all of the members had the same friends and enemies, a common foreign policy, and any city that got attacked, the League would rush to its defense. And also, any city that went to war in an offensive manner would also be assisted by the League. There was no provision for money. Each state was expected to provide for their own forces when they were engaged in League activities. There was also no schedule for meetings, 
and decisions in terms of where to move the army was done with the common consent of the league members. So this was a Pan-Hellenic League, and it was a real big thing. It was the first time anything had been done like that. Another key point to the Hellenic League is that you could come and go as you pleased. You didn't necessarily have to participate. And so that's what we see the Spartans doing now. They're just heading back to the Peloponnesus. It doesn't mean that the Greek League is over. And so that's why Athens and her allies formed the Delian League. It's a little bit of a different concept. First, obviously, it'll be run by Athens. But secondly, it will continue the war against Persia. Interestingly, there were 150 cities that joined it. So this is quite a huge deal. In fact, the Greek League only had around 35 members. So this is a big deal, and it has a lot of power. Now, the initial intent, of course, was to kick the Persians back into the desert where they belong. That's the original intent. Now, that will change going forward, but we will discuss that in future videos. So over the next three decades, the Delian League would expel the Persians from Macedon, Thrace, and almost all the Aegean islands in Ionia. And a lot of that happened in the 470s. Now, in the 460s, the Delian League went for it all and attempted to liberate Egypt. But that actually failed. And with that, Athens and her allies and the Delian League finally decided that the war needed to come to an end and came to some agreement with Persia. And the generally recognized year that the Greco-Persian Wars end is in 449 BC. Okay, I'd like to make some final points here on the Greco-Persian Wars before we close this video. And the first is that this was a major upset over the Persians. In fact, if we just look at numbers alone, in 480 BC, it was estimated that 50 million people lived in the Persian Empire, or almost half of the world's population at that time, making it the largest empire the world had ever seen. The Greeks might have only had a few million. So that in itself is really amazing. And I don't think anything like this upset has ever been seen again. The other big point is that the Greeks were allowed to continue with what they were doing. Greek freedom was left intact and it was not interrupted by the Persians. And that meant that Western civilization would continue. Now, had the Persians prevailed, I think this would be a very different world that we live in today. There undoubtedly would have been no Alexander the Great and perhaps no Roman Empire. The other idea that I mentioned was this idea of Pan-Hellenism. The Greeks had a sense of themselves as a single entity. But we have to be careful because this existed only during the Greco-Persian Wars. As we will see in the coming video, the bitter rivalries that existed before will begin to surface again and culminate in the Peloponnesian Wars. And of course, Athens becomes the dominant player in Greece along with Sparta. Okay, that is going to do it for this video. And in the next videos, we will be building up to the Peloponnesian Wars, the other defining war in Greek history.